The only message I have, I don't have anything else. I don't have some other revelation. The only thing I have is from this book. You've got a problem with this book, you take it up with God. This is not the type of ministry where I tell you if you don't give and we don't take in X amount of dollars and if you don't do this and if you want this program and I just tell you this is your responsibility and the ministry is also your responsibility. Um, in that if you don't take care of it, let's just say I, I'm one person and I can't take care of everything. And yes, I have staff and there are volunteers and they can't take care of everything as well. It requires a whole community of faithers to, to be connected and to say this matters to me. Not because it may go away, but it matters to me because I've been called for a purpose. Not all have the same purpose, but I can tell you this, everybody has the capacity to just listen. Just listen. And then something great can happen when we push ego and pride aside and we realize that the Bible is not the type of thing like in today's society when you hear people talk about the Constitution and people treat it like abstract art to try and determine what they think the, founder, the founding fathers meant, their intent, which is always the legal battle when the higher courts take over and it's going to be something to be settled where we hear people say something that is moving and evolving with us, but it, it hasn't moved or evolved because let's be honest and let's not lie to ourselves. Um, we, we have evolved as a cult. I don't really know that we've evolved, but we have in some form, I can't even call it progress. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is it's something that should never be discussable. If that's the document we say represents our country, then it's, it's just the way it is. And you can say, well, but what about the things that don't fit into it? The reason why I'm using this analogy is because a lot of times people would like the convenient subjectivity to decide. And this is one area where in God's book, God says it's not even discussable. Now, why do we do You see, we can make the same application of what we do with uh, our, the document of our founding, founding fathers and any articles related that were amended. But when we come to some book like this, we can say, well, it's, it's a matter of private interpretation. Well, the Bible clearly says there is no scripture that is of private interpretation. So when God says, this thing that I ask you to do, which is first and foremost, trust me, faith in me, not me, God. Secondly, to recognize you're not your own, you're bought with a price. That price came at the expense of sending his only begotten son to shed his blood, to save our souls and to reconcile us back to God if we would indeed trust that he was, is, and when he returns will be savior, deliverer, redeemer. So it's highly important to me that I just kind of tap people on the shoulder a little bit and say, don't, don't deceive yourself. You can play that game with your friends and your family, but when it comes to God, it's like saying, you got to put it all out there, which includes being honest with yourself if you are not participating but you like to uh, glean from the master's table, from the book, and say, but I don't, ha I don't have a responsibility. You deceive yourself. It is not subjective. Now, I know I've told you this argument before, and I'm just going to do this now because it fits right into just before we take up the offering. All those folks out there that are uptight about the tithe and under the guise of legalism, and I guarantee you I find most of the people who kvetch, because I can't say the other word, about tithing are the same people that if you go down the argument and follow their argument that the tithe is Old Testament, which by the way, I'm sorry, it is not. It was even going on in Jesus' day. But if you follow their argument, then the question is, then what you, my friend, who are against this idea in your mind, what is it then that you should be giving? And I have never, and that is with a capital N, found anybody who gives more than if they were tithing. In other words, if it's left to their own discretion, they do what I've referred to as the Catholic Lint offering. You put what's in your pocket, it's the change. And I'm sorry God is not looking for your tips. So, yeah. So, 
when I tell you about the grace of giving, that is not under coercion. That's not saying, hey, if you don't give, I'm doing my part in telling you why people who have heard the gospel have a responsibility. The Bible says if you know something that God has revealed and you choose to turn your back from it, you are, you are more guilty because you knew better. This is what Romans talks about. So I don't want to hear anybody and their arguments about, oh, the tithe. Figure out that if you're going to complain about the tithe, which is 10% over all of everything, then be sure to be giving more than a tithe, more than a tenth, for those people who have an issue with it, because my Bible also tells me, in the New Testament, God loves a hilarious giver. And the people who quetch about the tithe are about the cheapest, driest, in their generosity, in their kindness, not just towards the Lord, but to their fellow brothers. Those are the people, my friends, who I find to be the most malicious attackers uh, out there on social media because they can hide behind their computer, but they cannot hide from God. And that's why some people say, well, don't you want to do something about stuff you hear and you see? Well, no, I only have to worry about my responsibility is putting the information out there. You choose to decide what you do with it. That's pretty fair, isn't it? Yes, and no one can say in the sound of my voice, because I'm, I'm looking at myself at 51, and there's a lot less room in front of me than there is behind me. That I'm sure of. So I want to make it clear to every, every eardrum that can hear me in the sound of my voice, let it never be said that I didn't tell you or I didn't share with you what God, not in the Old Testament, but through and through, has been saying. And as I said, I don't know how you could consider the tithe Paul's hilarious giving. Do you think limiting your giving is, is hilarious? Do you? Because hilarity is done in such a sense where it's an outpouring. So I don't want to hear any of these people because their, their argument is always the same. It always falls flat. And the only thing that it does to me is it lets me know that there are a lot of people who are turned over delusional and believe a lie. And the Bible says those people are damned. I'm just the information bearer. I don't pass judgment on you, okay? So let it be said that I warn the folks out there, and I'm talking about those casual folks because it is those folks that essentially have the capacity beyond the regular core of givers to participate. But for whatever the reason, whether it's because they're not here and they think nobody sees so it doesn't matter, and as I said to you, you can deceive other people, but the information in this book is not subjective, where you kind of decide what portion of it you like, and you can cherry pick. Oh, I like the part where it says, if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive them. Oh, I love that, right? And to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But when it says God loves a hilarious giver, and he's not talking about the thing that I just referenced of some people's idea of what hilarity is, he thinks that there's a problem. There's a great disconnect. It's kind of is a weird analogy, and I'm just going to say it right here, which is I remember and most of you were around to see my late husband had a tremendous car collection. Tremendous. But I'm going to say that about maybe 85% of those cars were the shell looked okay, but the, if you opened up the hood, and they might have been clean, but you know how value goes? You can't get very far when the thing won't even run. It may look great, but if it doesn't run, not going to do too much good. So when I, and I told you, I think I've said this before over the years, I did indeed liquidate the vast majority of things that I could because to me it was wasteful to have lots of things sitting around rusting when the money could have been put to better use. And that's my mindset. Brought a guy and I said, I want you to take everything or you get nothing. Why? Because I'm not stupid. I know that there may be a couple, two, three items that may be well worth somebody who's a collector who says, well, you know, this person doesn't know anything. This is years ago, so don't think this happened yesterday. This happened at least, at least uh, 14 years ago. But the guy said, well, you know, I, I really don't want everything. I just want, I just want this and I want that. And I said, no cherry picking. You take it all or you get nothing. You take it all or you get nothing. You may be seated. Um, 
last couple of weeks, we have been studying the meaning, trying to get a better sense of what the word holy and sanctify mean. Um, I've been laying some pretty heavy stuff on you, so I thought today is a good day to kind of add a dimension to what we're looking at without going too heavy, which is really good for me and probably really good for you. All right, so um, let me just say a few words on what I've called the, the difficulty, and it is the difficulty. And the difficulty of translation, especially with the Hebrew language. Now, those of you who studied Hebrew with me, we saw this, so the folks that did, you, you already know what we're dealing with. But I have a lot of people in the listening audience that didn't do Hebrew with me, and when you say Hebrew, it, it's always the reverse. People think somehow an ancient language may be more direct. Well, that may be true and is true, in fact, with, with Greek, but it is not true with the Hebrew. And so I, as years have gone by, I think I have a little bit more sympathy for the translators who made the English versions, especially those early uh, versions, I'm not even I'm not talking about Wycliffe or Tyndale, even though those would be the pivotal foundation of our language, but I'm really, of course, dealing and talking about the King James. Probably, um, if I think about it, if you think about it, uh, I don't know that, do you think, does anybody have the temerity to say that they have the wisdom, knowledge, expertise, theological understanding to take this whole King James Bible, forget about going to the original, and putting it into another tongue. And those of you who speak another language who are a little bit smart would go, mm -mm. no, no thank you. Because there's absolute, with theological definitions, you can't just fudge something and say, that'll do. You've got to be specific. So that's what we're dealing with in terms of language. Um, what I did on festival is try and lay out the Hebrew a little bit and how the verbs function. But as I said, I'm gonna keep it simple today and we'll see if we can spot a, it's almost like colors of the rainbow. Can we spot a nuance that belongs to the subject of holiness and sanctification that may not be the direct subject, but it is definitely a subcategory as a part of many others that will comprise of a whole a subcategory of things that we'll encounter in the Bible that may be attached to holiness and sanctification. So today, we're going to start in Exodus 17. And I'm going to read just seven verses. Exodus 17, verse 1. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys, according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses, and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? Two things that will be um, referenced in the name of the place later. He says, Why do you chide with me, and why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us, and our children, and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. I want to just stop there and say a commentary, which is not relevant to my message. But this, what I just read, it's kind of how I sometimes view people in this day and age. If they don't get what they want, if it doesn't come down exactly like they want, let's be a little bit more specific. Really, not, I'm not referencing you and insinuating you at all, but the church in general has been carried away with this, the people's demands, what we want. And that's why the church has... Um, leadership over the course of 
maybe a hundred years, has succumbed to that. What I've called the syncretistic engraft the world onto the church because that's the only way that people will say, oh, that's important. And because there's very little, dis there's very little respect in this day and age for the things of God. But what's interesting here, when I read this again, I realized that, you know, the people were ready, as Moses said, to kill him. But, you know, let's forget about the fact that Moses was the vessel that God used to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt's bondage. Let's forget the fact that it was at the hand, in Moses' hands, the rod, in his ears, the words directly from God to him as commandments to be carried out to show the various miracles in the hand of God. And these people still, after all they have seen, and they saw many miracles, including the plagues, all the deliverance, and if you just kind of look back at the page, the chapter before, you got the man and the quail that God makes rain from heaven for the people. And I sometimes think that's the way we are. It's never enough. God could bless us with a thousand blessings. We'd be griping about the thousand and one we didn't get. Here, the people are saying, did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us here? Because we're dying of thirst. Now, this is the wonder of it all. Moses was just the messenger. You know the expression, don't shoot the messenger? He's just the messenger. And yet the people, he, Moses says, he's aware, the people are ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, go on before the people, take with thee of the elders of Israel that thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, Take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So you can see here there are several issues disfaith on the part of the people, which, by the way, was why they were wandering in the first place. It's not because Moses didn't have a GPS and he couldn't figure out the way to get there directly in 40 years. Then we're talking about another 40 years. So very clearly, the main thing, what the King James is translating, chide uh, in verse 2, and tempt. These things that obviously are very offensive. So the place is named after chiding and tempting. These two Hebrew words are to describe strife, the waters of strife or the people striving, and the, um, the waters, as, as we know, uh, actually my margin says temptation and the waters of strife. So there you have those two words. Now why am I touching on this? Because it is in a different book in Numbers that we encounter a similar situation. And may I just say before we go there, the interesting thing is that up until this point, and I have this in my Bible from previous messages, but there are 12 complaints that are blatant by the children of Israel, this being the fifth one. And I think God chose the number 12 to record 12, these 12 uh, incidences, which I'm sure there were more, but 12 gives you at least an idea, if you want to call it government or two times the number of a man, which is what we seem to be good at, complaining right before God. Now, I was sick yesterday, and I was also sick this morning. And the only thing I could say was not, not to complain, was to say, thank God it wasn't worse. And I know that the Lord will make me better. Now. You know, there's always different ways to look at things, but the children of Israel obviously didn't get it, so you've got another element here, and it's really going to be the focus of where I go. That is, something that occurs in a similar uh, passage, in a similar situation. Once again, the children of Israel find that they don't have any water. Once again, they're almost back at the same place because they will journey and they will actually backtrack and end up at the same place again where they started at a place called, well, they didn't start there, but at Kadesh, and they'll end up again at Kadesh. And by the way, Kadesh is from our Hebrew word of the same spelling, just the vowels that change, of the word holy. So even that place, the name of that place, you could say it's a proper name, but it also ties into our word. Now that's 
definitely not my focus. I just thought I'd mention that in passing. But if you turn to Numbers 20, and here's where the lesson comes. Lesson 20, uh, sorry, chapter 20, Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. So you have the background, and there's been a whole lot of um, wondering in the meantime. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried there. And there was no water for the congregation. They gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. Now, I ask you a question. See, I think if we have just a little bit of faith, having to take the baby steps, because it's always hard to get started. I remember when I first started faithing, and it's like, well, I don't know if I can, can I trust God? Because you don't know. If you don't know enough, if you haven't spent enough time in the book, you don't know. So you, you start taking God at his word and through his promises, and God says, for example, the steps of a good man, but really it's not, there's no man, it's the steps of a person, man or woman, ordered by the Lord. That means that I have to get up if I'm going to claim that promise and faith that God's going to order my steps. He's going to establish them and he's going to guide me. And I can take and build a similar bridge to that promise and say, as he guides me, his word, his word will be a lamp under my feet. And as he guides me and that light shines and guides me, I know that there is the light that he has placed in me. And I can keep going, Christ in me, the hope of glory. I can keep going on this. But it's, it's the start of grabbing hold of a promise. What time I'm afraid, I will trust in the Lord. You can grab on to anything, but then once you see God's hand in action and you see that actually you trusted and took God at his word, then it becomes a little bit easier the next time. Because you know that you saw it one time, you saw God come through for you. And it becomes a little bit easier. And then faith comes. And faith comes by the word of God. Faith comes by the action of trusting God and taking him at his word. So the very thing that I can say here, just in two verses, don't you think it's kind of sad that the children of Israel never came to the place of saying, hey, we know what God did back there, and we know that God will do it again. We're going to trust and not worry. We're going to trust and not fret. We're going to trust and not be afraid. We're going to trust that the Lord will provide. That's one of his names. But instead, it says they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. I got to tell you this one thing as a, again, it's a sidebar editorial, kind of really makes me mad that the people went against Moses and Aaron. They were just the messengers. Let this be just a sidebar message to some people out there who get very critical of me when the only message I have, I don't have anything else. I don't have some other revelation. The only thing I have is from this book. You've got a problem with this book, you take it up with God. Don't start throwing the daggers my way, which is what most people in my 20 years of being around this ministry, that's all I've seen. When people get don't get what they want, or they don't get their way, or whatever it is, and they're ready to go and take it on the person. I watched them do it to Dr. Scott. I've seen other ministers and other ministries, and the same thing, people tend to take it out on the minister. And the example's right here, Moses and Aaron once more. You might say, well, that's unfair. It's unfair to them. Or maybe somebody might say, well, but they were the messengers. They were communicating from God. And I'm going to tell you, if I was Moses, I would have told the people, and, and ultimately, I can't rewrite, and I'm not Moses, but I would have told the people, you got a problem with this? Take it up with God. And if you got a problem with this, you really got a problem. <laughs> but that's not the way this happens. The people, verse 3, chode with Moses, spake, saying, would God, that, would God that we have died when our brethren died before the Lord? And why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our cattle should die there? You notice how they're phrasing this. Why did you do this? That's why I said, don't, you know, unless I tell you I've got a personal opinion for something, take your issues up with God. Do me a favor. You know, all the people who gripe about stuff, take it up with God. 
you talk to God about it. That's not the, because I don't want to hear your, your problems or your issues, but after a while I recognize that God has repeated himself over and over and over throughout 66 books. You're going to find repetition. One of them is rebellion. The other one is disobedience. That just seems to be an imprint of Adam on the heart of humankind today. So, note, but I'm just noteworthy to say they're blaming him. You did this to us. Well, I wish Moses would have said, hey, got a problem? Right. And wherefore you have made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place. It is no place of seed, no, or, nor figs, or vines, or of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, gather thou the assembly together, and, and Aaron thy brother, and speak unto the rock before their eyes. Speak to it. Now remember, in Exodus, he said, Strike the rock. Here he says, Speak to the rock. He said, Take the rod. But he never mentions anything about striking the rock. He just says, take the rod, but speak to the rock. And here's the key here. Speak to the rock before their eyes. In other words, there, there, there is the whole congregation to witness. Just as when God said, take the rod and strike it, there were the elders. Here is the whole congregation gathered, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shall bring forth to them water out of the rock, so shall thou give the congregation and their beasts drink. Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. So now everybody's gathered. And he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch, water, must, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And I'm, I'm not quite sure that when you read it, you know, the King James sounds kind of, because of the, the wonderful poetry, if you will, of the English, it sounds a little bit um, not as coarse. Verse 10 from the Hebrew. Let's take a look at this. So he says, you rebels, must we, must we bring you the water out of this rock? And I think the implication here is with all of your, your verbiage, with all of your complaints, with everything else, and we have to do this for you. So what's in Moses' response immediately is, I would say, like an immoderate or an excessive reaction to the attitude of the people. Remember, his was not to overreact, just to give the orders as God said and carry them out. If there was something to be carried on this case, speak to the rock. So. As most of you are familiar with this, Moses took the, rock from before, the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. Not once, not twice, but what were the orders of God to speak to it? The water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. Now here are two key verses, and then we'll take off on kind of an exposition on this. Moses lifted up his hand, smote the rock twice, the water came out, and the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, because ye believed me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and he was sanctified in them. Now, first thing I'm going to do is I, I, I said I wasn't going to do any Hebrew, but I lied. <laughs> Actually, I just thought, you know what, it'll make more sense if I show this to you. Um, first of all, we'll write out the things that I would say you might, if you're a Hebrew a student, that's great. Um, here, because, not, and you'll see why I love looking at these words. They have a better sense for me in Hebrew than they do as they are translated in English, confusion of belief. But what this word 
is translating, or what this word is saying, is we have here in the middle, let's take another color, we have the letters for amen, right? So let's make up something here and let's say amen. Because not you amen me, God is speaking, right? So we're going to have our word, our Hebrew word for holy in the middle of this word. And let's do that like that. That's my yod. I'm very sorry. It doesn't look like one. It looks like a mistake, but it is not. All right. Let's take a look at this word and let's see. So this is kind of interesting. This is our word and the letters. Kof, Dalid, and Shin for what is being translated in your King James, sanctify, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. So the whole verse should read, that whole passage should read as such. Um, the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron, because you did not amen me enough, and I'm qualifying using, I don't know that enough is the right word to put in there, but we'll just say, to honor me as holy. So here we have the words holy, or the word for holy, but it is in the hithil infinitive, which, not to get too technical, but it also means it's in the construct. So this word would be attached to the next word it follows. Don't, you don't need to know that for this purpose today. All I want you to know is how I might translate this in a free flow, so it's not verbatim, but because not, you amen me, the lamid, to, um, to honor me as holy. The Lord is speaking now. To honor me as holy. Therefore, in the eyes, in front of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Now, People, commentators, students of the Bible have said, boy, this is really a harsh punishment that neither Moses, well, Aaron's going to die, um, I think, when, just as soon as they leave Kadesh, he's going to die. Miriam's already dead, and now Moses remains, and Moses is just told, he, basically, and he'll, it'll be re reiterated, he will not be allowed to enter into the Promised Land. And God grants him the grace to go up to Mount Nebo as he pleaded with him to go and just take a look at the land. And we know the favor of God, as I've taught many times, that this is why the New Testament has the passage that says that they, there was a battle over the body of Moses. And within the Gospels, the appearance, at least in the eyes of Peter, while they were on the Mount of Transfiguration, where it says that Moses and Elijah appeared, where that silly, you know, shall we build three tabernacles here? One for you, Lord, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, because you're all even, right? Okay, so the important thing here is the congregation is gathered. This is happening in front of the congregation, and there has been an order, a, di a divine decree by God. Moses, do this. And this is where it gets a little difficult to explain, because there will be people who will take this type of an explanation and feel that it, it's, it doesn't even, does the punishment justify? Is this all in reality? I mean, is God that angry all the time? And the answer is no. But right there, when it says that you didn't honor me, your 12th verse, where it says, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, Our, my Hebrew word, because it's, it's got a lot going on, and because of the, the, the uh, tense that is in, which is in the hiffel, which I've told you at least this much. You don't need to know all of the conjugations in Hebrew, but it usually is causative. In fact, I brought out my Rosses thinking just maybe I might uh, review this, but in the sense of causing someone to become or causing, in this case it would be, to cause the children of Israel to see that God's word is holy. And God is holy. And 
this is the bad translation I want to deal with in verse 13. Because the last part of that verse says, uh, well, let me read this very small. This is the water of Meribah because the children of Israel strove with the Lord and he was sanctified in them. Does that make sense to you? And that's why even in the smallest word can alter the essence of what the original was trying to convey. And I can tell you what the original was trying to convey and it wasn't, it, it doesn't come across as that. So what you have here in verse 13, and this is something you may want to make a note on, because from the Hebrew directly, um, where your King James says, and he was sanctified in them, it should actually read that they quarreled with the Lord where he showed himself holy among them. Don't you think there's a little difference there? He wasn't sanctified in them. And, you know, if somebody's asking me, well, how, how do you get that? Let's go to verse, I said that's verse 13, and I'm reading from my uh, interlinear, but I'm looking at the Hebrew. So it says here, if you want to get that whole sense, they quarreled the sons of Israel with Yahweh, and he showed himself holy among them. His word would not be changed or his promise to provide would not be changed in the face of Moses' disobedience, and it was disobedience. But this, this brings, uh, as I, I'm calling it, a dimension that must be attached to understand, we're, we're trying to understand the word holiness, which the King James is using sanctify and sanctified, both in verb form, which I tried to say to you, you'll find more of the ad adjectival translating holy and more of the verbal form as sanctified and um, the other one is uh, sanctified and sanctify. So what I want us to kind of put a few mental notes here. One of them is Moses' disobedience to the divine command or directive. And this is where people fall off the cliff because we're not dealing with the law. We're not even de dealing with the Torah. God simply spoke and gave an order. In order to, A, accomplish the purpose, Moses, the first time, strike the rock. Second time when they're there, that, you know, maybe in God's mind, and there are those that hold the belief, and I, I am of that belief too, that Christ is that rock, because that's what Paul talks about in the New Testament. And the striking of the rock was only done once. Christ only died once. He didn't need to be dying several times like some uh, other folks might believe that you know, Christ just keeps dying and every time you go to the table of the Lord, he keeps dying. That's frightening. That'd be a very miserable God if you ask me. Um, but apart from what I just said, there is this, it, it is a lack of amen. Now, I believe that you, you're going to kind of have to press the line a little bit with this. But not necessarily the children of Israel because God knew the children of Israel. But I think the surprise comes, and I'm not sure that it really surprised God, but the surprise comes when Moses actually loses his temper a little bit because of the people. And instead of doing what God said, his actions were reactionary to the people. You bunch of rebels, you're putting this on my back. Now... <laughs> You can say whatever you want, but I'm going to say the key lessons that I glean out of here, the impartiality of the administration of God's plan or his will or his word, which should bring us to the mindset, it is, even though it is Moses reacted, he still mishandled the word of God. You know, when we talk about today, when people rest the word of God and they twist it to try and fit a meaning they want, Moses still rested the word here because God said and God spoke, but Moses did otherwise. Now, God still made good on his word because it says the water flowed out of the rock, but the punishment meted out was he said no one's going to enter into the promised land. Well, of course, we know that um, there's going to be a handful. Um, Caleb and whatever band goes with him, that's about it. So kind of interesting, very, very uh, sad that people will make commentaries on this and say, well, you know, that's very harsh of God, but I, I do understand 
If you're looking at the Hebrew as I've just described it in these two verses, they didn't amen God enough to, and this is why I said it's a dimension, to, if you want to say it this way, to declare God to be, or to cause God to be seen in the eyes of the people, not for the control they might have had over the people, but because God spoke something, obedience to the voice of the sayer carried it out, and it became, and therefore it would be, holy. And the right translation of verse 13, when it's, instead of saying, and he was sanctified in them, this is where he showed himself holy among them. I, my word, God speaking, my word will not be disrespected, is what God's saying there. And we talk about the word holy, and the holiness of God as an attribute of God, as a dimension of God. So when God says, because you didn't amen me as to honor me as holy in front of the people, it wasn't that he was saying, do reverence, but I gave you my word and you disobeyed. And this happened all in front of the congregation. So a dimension, I want to put this in a nutshell and kind of tie this up. In a nutshell, what you have is when God speaks and says a thing, just like in the garden, just like when he created Let's go all the way back there again, when God spoke, and out of nothing, everything. And you can say, well, the matter could have rebelled. Well, I don't know. Uh, it could have, but it didn't. I'm assuming that's if something has a will of its own. Um, let's talk about Adam and Eve. God gave a word concerning one tree in the garden, said everything else, you can have everything else, but this one tree do not touch. And I've said, although that tree, there's no word to to qualify it as holy, it was a holy tree. God said, don't touch. Everything else you can have, this one thing you cannot. How about the place where Cain and Abel were supposed to offer? And all offerings are holy unto the Lord. So even back then, before the law, before any description, I'm sure they had been given an order by God. This is what, when we look at the two brothers offering, the voice of the Lord expressed displeasure in the one that was not following. We, we don't have these instructions, but obviously and clearly God said, this is the place, this is how you offer. And we can, you just keep going. You can keep looking at a diversity of people in the Bible. You go all the way through the Bible, Lot's wife, don't turn back, you're turned into a pillar of salt. Now, if you believe that, and I actually think she must have turned into a pillar of salt, but if you believe that, I'd say once more, when God says a thing, it is. So being obedient or disobedient plays a big part, we'll call it a dimension, of understanding holiness and sanctification. Put it to you this way, if somebody is going to do the opposite of what God says, or rest it just a little bit, do you think that God is going to say, and I'm pleased with that? Got to think of something that will be strike home. How about this? How about, I don't know, mom, you tell your kids to take out the garbage. I'm not gonna, not gonna say hubby's gonna do it, but you tell your kids to take out the garbage. Instead of taking out the garbage, they take out the cat. Because <laughs> they think you said take something out, so therefore, right? But that's not what you said. Now, you can say whatever you want, but if you said take the garbage out, you want them to take out the garbage. It's not discussable, the truck's gonna come your garbage is still going to be sitting there if they don't, and it'll sit there until eventually they figure out that mom said garbage, not cat, right? It's like that. It would be pretty angering to you after a while. Oh, she says, tell me about it, right? You see the look on it, tell me about it. No, you got good kids. I'm not going to say that. But it would be frustrating if you kept asking somebody to do something and they do something else, or they do it, but they put their own twist on it. In my own personal administration of this ministry. Nothing has driven me more insane than people doing what's right in their own eyes because they think whatever they're going to do, it's right. And pastor will love what I'm doing because it's a good thing. I meant a good thing by doing this. You ever heard of this? The road to hell is paved with good intentions? Well, well then don't follow the signage. <laughs> Having said that, what I want to point out here, and th this um, the two passages, Exodus and Numbers, I think demonstrate this adequately. 
Now, don't take this as the whole sum total of our lesson on holiness or sanctification, but it must be a dimension. It must tie into, because now let's take a look at, and we're going to get a little bit more specific. It's Moses and Aaron that are given the task, and now most specifically, Moses is given the task of carrying out the order that God gave. And you see what happened. How about, as I mentioned, I believe, last week, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, offering up strange fire. These sons had to have been holy or declared holy to carry out their duties, but they didn't, they put a spin on it. Wherever they got the fire from, and we know it is implied that they probably had strong drink before they went in to do their service, which two things, when God says, when you go in to do service, you essentially be sober. No, don't touch any drink at all. And the other thing is, whatever you do in there, you're carrying out the orders of God. If this is what you're supposed to do, this is what you're supposed to do. So people might say, well, that's such a tough thing. Is God that cruel that he kills Nadab and Abihu because they're not following God's orders? But here's the thing, God's word itself is holy. Why do people call this the Holy Bible? Or from the New Testament, when things are inspired by the Holy Spirit because it's something that comes from God and shouldn't be treated casually or it shouldn't be treated profanely. Now, take a look at all the different words and examples over the last couple of weeks, and you'll see that in, in Exodus 17, Numbers 20, the bookends of what I've shown today, it becomes kind of evident, I think, it's actually it should be self-evident, that God, is, God recognizes our shortcomings, and he recognizes the fact that we're going to mess up. But when we are to take his word and amen it, there isn't multiple voices speaking. This is the trouble that people get in when they won't study the Bible for themselves. And, and when I say study, follow along with me, do your own reading. And I believe a lot of times people will read and they come up with some of the most twisted and caricatured interpretations. So I'm not going to say that that's always profitable. But the reason for doing this is to get familiar enough with God's ways and to understand that God, when God spoke something, he said, don't treat my words casually. Don't take it as just another voice giving another order. In your house, you're calling the shots. This is God's domain. He's calling the shots. And the thing that has been offensive to God is his word. He is holy. His word is holy. But people take his word and they treat it casually, profanely. So you have the sense of what is implied in verses 12 and 13, which is a building block for us to kind of say this um, example, and we'll see others that, as I've said, shades of things, but this, this particular example today has much to do with holiness, and the, the, the King James is using the word sanctify and sanctification or sanctified and sanctify, um, have much to do in this particular case with Obedience to his word. And let's make sure that we all understand obedience because there are some people that think it's just Pavlov's dog. And you, you know, bark, say bark, and I'll bark. Obedience is what Dr. Scott defined it as. I haven't found a better definition. Running to the voice of the sayer. The sayer in this case is God running to his voice. It does not mean that you will achieve perfection in doing so, or that you will be classified as something else, but you act on his word in faith and obedience, and then you stand still. Don't be trying to figure out, you know, I'll, I can take the profane and I can add to this. It really is like when people say, don't lean on the arm of the flesh, lean on the arm of God. Well, the arm of God is holy, and the arm of the flesh really most of the time is profane, and outside of the sphere of even considering or respecting the things that are holy and that belong to God. So my lesson today is short and simple, and I don't really want to build too much more on this because I think the lesson speaks of its own. Um, but I will say this to you. When somebody, I've heard people say, well, don't you think God's punishment to the whole congregation is, is, is unfair? And I'll say this again. God's sovereign. God can do whatever he wants. God can say and I'm just pointing generically because I don't want to point at anybody, but I've had enough of you. 
no. You've already been through enough. But my point is, God's, God's word, when he says, I am, and this is why I, I, sometimes I have sadness inside of me regarding people's discounting of, of God's word. Because it takes nothing at all to sit down and read this book, whether you read it and cover to cover, book by book, however you do it, to at least say, you've read through the book, and I'm sorry, even one reading as a first time reader, you're not gonna get the essence, but you will get some key words that keep repeating themselves and repeating themselves, and especially in the Old Testament, I am the Lord, I am holy, I, and add on because it's God that's saying, I did these things, you didn't do them, I gave you the ability to get wealth, you did not, when you came out of Egypt, who delivered you? You did not deliver yourselves. So in the process, I think this particular passage and this lesson deal mostly with, it, it attaches our minds to the concept of holiness, and it lets us see that on the flip side, there's not just profane, common, casual, but there's also when God is giving a word. Now, folks might say, well, it's just Moses and Aaron, and you mentioned Nadab and Abihu, and these people are highfalutin in the congregation. We're not those people. No, you're right, you're not those people. Peter says in, in the New Testament, you are a royal priesthood. And he's speaking of the body of believers. That means each person is considered and viewed in the New Testament as a priest, a priest in their own home. And that doesn't mean everybody has an independent ministry, but everybody is ruling their own household, and that, that comes with the word of God. So I think very important, um, put somewhere in these uh, lessons somewhere, that obedience to God's word, that is running to the voice of the sayer and not doing what's right in your own eyes, not being a reactionary, not trying to rest, but to take God at his word is, I would say, one stepping stone if you're going to look at holiness and sanctification in God's direction versus what we tend to do, which is don't need it, don't want it, doesn't make sense, I don't care about it. But taking that first step in listening to the voice of the sayer, well, what about the crazy stuff in the Bible? I'm just giving you some plausible uh, devil's advocate tools which people tend to use all the time. What about the things where, you know, God wipes out a bunch of people, he tells the people, go kill all that army over there. Well, listen, if God spoke to you, and I'm not talking about imaginary voices, because some people imagine things, but I'm talking about if audibly, and you knew with, without a doubt, you knew that you knew that you knew that you knew that God was speaking to you, and God gave you instructions. Now, this is what wacky people do, right? But if God gave you the instructions, you better follow them. Now, some, some nut job out there is going to say, yeah, the Lord told me to do thus and so, because that's what they always do. But I'm saying to you, let's take it from the book, because I have not heard God's voice audibly, and I believe that the bulk of the people listening to me, um, you know, some people say they hear things, but most people don't. So what we can hear is what we read and what we see and what we glean out of the book. Obedience is better than sacrifice, and rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And when we're taking and handling God's word, it is important to not rest it. That's why I said to you, I put the information out there. You take it. I'm not going to shove it down your throat. I'm not going to force feed you. You take it, pray about it, meditate, think on what it might mean, how it might apply. Go and study other passages with a similar um, driving concept and you'll measure your, your faith and your faith walk on God's repeatables. When God is repeating something over and over again, he's got my attention and I hope he gets yours. So the takeaway today is very simple. As I've been talking about this word and defining this word, now as we move through the Old Testament, as I've kind of planned a couple of lessons looking ahead, um, we're going to see a little bit of a change in how the word might be used. And Really, it'll be a change that is going to be strictly, well, I should say, most usages will be towards the Lord. Very few will be towards the people. And at this point, um, it becomes important to recognize if, if God, through his inspired writers, is putting such a premium, an important place, on what is attached to God and what comes from God, we ought to pay attention. It becomes something that should be 
of importance to us to know. So this lesson here, God's word is supreme. When God speaks, he is. His word is holy. And what could have been for the children of Israel, but they would not. Amen. And take him at his word, which caused God to obviously keep uh, the whole, pretty much the whole tribe, the whole clan, if you will, the children of Israel, out of the land. And the few that entered in, they entered in, by the way, I think if you read forward, and those of you who know the Old Testament, I don't think that a person like Caleb, he didn't have that rebellious spirit. If God said, go in and do this, he might have had a little bit of fear, but his great proclamation, give me this mountain, an old man, but he had enough sense to have the faith upon entering in, although there was a little bit of, oh my gosh, what are we going to do here with those that saw everything going on in the land, the faith that comes from this individual is the faith that God's looking for in each and every one of us. Take God at his word, trust him, run to the voice of the sayer, and that is almost, as I said, the first step in understanding how God views our reception of his word and his command. For if he is holy and our ears are turned to the holy one, believe me, if you really view him as holy, you will be running to his word and running to what he has decreed, asked, or promised. Really, it's very simple. God just says, take me at my word. There's your choice. You can make it today. You can take God as word and say, I amen what God says, and I'm going to stand on that, or I choose to do otherwise. And again, the consequences for, for disobedience in the Old Testament are quite severe. Uh, somebody said in a commentary, you know, the God of old, this is that separation of the God of the Old Testament versus the God of the New. No, it's the same God dealing with the same kind of people throughout the generations. Because why, even when our Lord Jesus Christ came, people did not believe that he was who he said he was, even though he showed with many mighty miracles and power. And the things that he taught, even the rabbis were blown away, but they said, it can't be. We still have that today. So I'm asking those of you who read the Bible, keep growing in faith and keep trusting the Lord and keep walking in his word running to the voice of the sayer, pressing close to him. That is the first step when we talk about sanctification, not complete sanctification here, but at least that partial beginning that is the work that God begins that will go on through your entire life until you are, as Thessalonians says, wholly sanctified over there on the other side. Until then, we'll keep chiseling away at what exactly this means for all of us. In the meantime, that's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.